and I gave him the property. And initially I had to leave my kids. So how did you, how do you make that decision? Um, I don't think people realize you get to choose who's healthy for you and who's not. But what we continually do is, is we're looking up the narcissist and we're looking up bipolar and we're looking up all of these diagnoses, hoping for a checklist that the person in question is going to fit. And then we go, can go down the checklist and, oh yes, they're this. So now I'm validated. You know, when I was in my former relationship, I'll, all I heard was the things that were wrong with me. But what you were saying is some people don't stick around. You know, some people might hang out with them for a little while and then be like, oh, well, that guy's not very nice. Or, or she was, she says really mean things. And so, so you step out of it right? Those are the ones who are not yet emotionally invested into the relationship. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the podcast. Welcome back to the YouTube channel. I'm very happy to have with me today, Heidi Brocky, who is a specialist on getting out of toxic relationships. And we were just talking right now, and I thought I'd just uh, hit the the record button immediately because a few interesting points came up, such as she doesn't, or Heidi, you don't talk in uh, therapy speak. You like to talk in layperson's terms. And I noticed also you talk about toxic relationships as opposed to narcissists, Mm -hmm. which is something I'm very keen to do. But I'd like to hear how come, what's the background and why these, why these choices? Okay. Now the minute you ask my background, we're going to need more than an hour. (laughs) Anytime I hear the word background, I'm like, you better get a whiskey because I don't know. Um, Yeah. So that's a question that hasn't been the first one on many of the podcasts. Usually people want to know how I got into it and you know, all of that. But um, the, I'm not a mental health professional. I'm not a licensed mental health professional. My doctorate is in chiropractic acupuncture. And, and so not that, not that I have anything against therapy terms. I just, I don't know them and I don't diagnose and I don't treat it. Um, the reason I'm doing what I'm doing is because I spent almost 15 years in a relationship that, of course, when I was in it, I had no idea what it was. Um, I got out. We can talk about that because that's another that's another whiskey. Um, but you don't know what it is. And then you get out. And I started looking back on it. And so when I work with people, I speak in the language that I would have used when I was describing it when I was in it. And I think that that um, I have my own podcast, which I didn't mean to have. Um, I started podcasting because I had never talked about my story. And I thought if I could start talking about it on there, um, but people can really relate because when I'm talking in the terms of when I was in it, it sounds like I'm basically watching their life or, you know, following them around. Um, I don't have anything against therapy terms. It's just, I don't use them because I don't know them all. Yeah, that's, that's understandable. I mean, something, you know, that I've seen is there's a big difference between people who understand things theoretically. So they have concepts all very nice, but then there's always a thing of specifically, what does it mean? Like Mm -hmm. you say this thing on a day-to-day basis, how does it manifest itself? And until we experience it, the theory sounds, well, a little bit crazy, but when we've actually experienced what it's like, you know, day after day, minute after minute, going through these things, uh, the experience is completely different. And I find sometimes there's an interesting ping pong between the, the very detailed understanding, some concepts that may illuminate certain things, but I see there's a big difference between people having a conceptual understanding and the ones who go, I've lived it, now it clicks. And there's, um, it's much more relevant, I find, when people mm-hmm. talk out of experience. I find the two are helpful. The two are helpful, but without the, the 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 basic experience, it can just be, you know, well, detached from reality. Not not helpful. Yep, yep. I used to practice. Um, I had a practice with my former husband, which I'm sure he'll come up eventually, also. But he always spoke in very chiropractic, very medical terms, and his patients would come out of his office, and then they'd ask me to tell him what he meant. And, and that's kind of the concept here. You know, I don't say the the femur and the acetabulum. I say, well, it's where your leg attaches to your hip. And then they go, yeah. oh, that, yeah. And it's kind, of, it's kind of a little bit more like that. You know, th- this reminds me of something, uh, one of the, the, the courses I followed. So I'm not either a mental health prote- uh, practitioner. I followed various courses. I use mm-hmm. a lot of the tools, but I don't want to label myself this way. Um, but one of the, the main things that we learned when I was doing a course in systemic therapy was never take what they call the high position. Mm-hmm. 
never talk down to people never assume you you are better or you know better mm -hmm. and as the my, my my teachers the professors were saying is simply you don't know better you're not in their shoes you don't mm -hmm. know what their life is like you don't know what the struggles are like treat them with respect you know you're supposed to be at the same level as them and one of the, the the things actually that I noticed with a lot of people in toxic dynamics is they're used to looking up to someone who knows better, a figure of authority, mm -hmm. be it a toxic person, be it a therapist, uh, be it uh, well a, anyone they look up to. And to me, that's part of the toxic dynamics. Being able to meet them at their level and speak mm -hmm. regular language is something I found empowering. I guess you've you've got a similar experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and. Um, again, I work with therapists and counselors all the time, so I always like to make sure that they know that uh, when, you know, when I work with somebody also, um, your therapist and your counselors are trained, they're trained to tr diagnose and treat. And, you know, when I was in my former relationship, I'll, all I heard was the things that were wrong with me, you know, and I think sometimes, okay, this is wrong with me. This is wrong with me. This is wrong with me. Now I need to go see a mental health professional. And to me, it was just another thing to put on the list of 8,652 things that was wrong with me. Now I'm seeing a, you know, mm -hmm. and, and even though I do absolutely believe that, you know, being diagnosed and being treated for the residual effects of emotional abuse is, is definitely necessary, but it took me 14 years to go to a therapist because, and, and you can ask the man that I'm married to now, he was literally like, why are you so against that? Oh, well, let me show you the list. You know, and it was it was just something in my head that that was just affirming that, oh, yep, there's another thing that is wrong with me that I'm going to have to go fix. Mm -hmm. So so I think that, you know, that when people know that I've been through it, they don't feel like they are getting fixed. They feel like they're coming to me for an education. Yep. I see the difference. You know, yeah, that's fair. Very... In their mind, it's a difference, you know. It's it, it's a massive difference, and it's something that, you know, I, I think we've we've got similar mindset with a few of these things, such as don't try to diagnose people, but observe what is toxic uh, in a dynamic. Which brings it back to, um, you know, one of the ways I put it is simply: is it working out for you? Mm -hmm. Because let's imagine, objectively, the other person is not quote unquote a narcissist, is not diagnosed, but it clearly is not working out for you at all, mm -hmm. and things are not improving. Well, what are you going to do about it? Yeah. yeah. So it goes back to what you were saying about, you know, the, yourself and mm -hmm. talking about the people as opposed to putting labels or diagnosing. Yeah. And when, when I decided, I did not decide to do this business. I should not use that word. This, this landed in my lap and I was like, are you serious? Um, but I chose the word toxic because toxic isn't a diagnosis, but I started doing this about eight years ago before it was all over the internet. You know, now if you if you watch any of your social media feeds, you would you would be led to believe that toxic is a diagnosis. Yes. And toxic is an adjective. You know, it just it describes any relationship in the status that it's in that's unhealthy for you mentally, physically, or emotionally. So I chose it so because knowing that I'm not diagnosing, I chose it because it's a blanket phrase. And and I, the thing that I find, and it was me too, it was 100 percent me. I don't think people realize. You get to choose who's healthy for you and who's not. But what we continually do is, is we're looking up the narcissist and we're looking up bipolar and we're looking up all of these diagnoses, hoping for a checklist that the person in question is going to fit. And then we go can go down the checklist and, oh, yes, they're this. So now I'm validated because you really feel like you need to be validated because all you've heard is it's you. If you could just change this, if you could just do better. So. We assume it's us, so we start digging into the research. And and I, I really have to kind of, I'll say I preach because I probably do preach a little bit to my clients. But yes, it doesn't matter if they have a diagnosis. Does it make the relationship any healthier for you? You know, and, and to get people to look at it from that perspective, some people go, oh, well, then what's my reason for leaving? Well, pull the rug out. Pull the rug out and see how much stuff is under there. But But people really think they have to have a valid reason. So they wait and wait and wait until they have one because they don't, they didn't know they had permission to leave something that's not good. I didn't. Yeah. Well, I did. I left it six times. Mm -hmm. you know, wow. It's you know, it's an interesting thing you 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 know pointing out the the thing about being validated, saying you have permission. It's as though in order to say you have a preference, you have to be able to back it up with absolutely solid evidence and just 
just as opposed to saying, well, actually, I feel like doing this. And mm -hmm. if you don't like it, it's okay. Yeah. No. Um, and one of the points actually about the, the being validated, sometimes you get people saying, you know, I want a clear answer. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think we seldom get clear answers because even if you take, for example, the, the, the hair psychopathy list with all of different criteria, no one is going to fit everything. So there'll always be some element of doubt if we try to diagnose. But then I like asking the question, let's imagine you get a clear answer either way. What next? What does it well, change? Then, well, then you have to jump over the self-doubt. Yeah. Because right off, you know, right off the bat, they start instilling, instilling self-doubt. A uh, third week I was married my to my former. Mm -hmm. He said, you know, I'm really disappointed in myself because I was always going to marry a blonde. Wow. Okay. So for 12 years, it was highlights in my hair. Highlight can you, I mean, look, you, you guys can see me. I don't have blonde <laughs> hair. Um, you know, and so, so what would happen is, is I wouldn't go to the beauty shop thinking, how does Heidi want to wear her hair? I would go to the beauty shop thinking, how do I think he wants me to wear my hair so I don't get criticized. And so I'm accepted. Mm -hmm. And and all through very slow drip through the relationship, stuff like this happens. Where do you want to go to eat? I want to go to Mexican. No, we don't. We're not having Mexican. We have Mexican all the time. You learn to say, I don't care. Yes, absolutely. because, every, you know, so if you can't if you can't make the decision on how to wear your hair, you're not going to make a big decision to, you know, break up the family unit and, you know, jeopardize financial supply mm, yeah. and and they they always they know that you're always going to question yourself that's true that's a good point is breaking the momentum of being able to make decisions even on the small things or mm -hmm. criticizing the small things yep. until until people become um i guess passive is the word sort of let things happen it sort of feels like there's a dynamic like this until people give in and then there's a bit of contempt because well i broke you so now it's you know i've won Something like yes, that. except then it just escalates, you know. So the now this obviously this I always have to tell people, I don't know how I know this. I just so it's not like this is scientific. This is doctor, this is Dr. Heidi stuff. Um, you know, the people that usually end up in relationships like this are are your caring, giving, fix it supporter, your peacekeepers, your conflict avoiders are are the ones who are gonna fall into this. Well, we're the ones if we're gonna avoid conflict. We're just going to say, I don't care where we eat because we'd rather just say, I don't care where we eat and not care where we eat than have to have a fight about it. Yep. You know, and, and that's the personality that your, your toxic personality is looking for because it's will adapt. It, it, it's an interesting thing. Are you familiar with the, the disc personality uh, profiles? Does it ring a bell you, to you? You know what? I looked at that a couple of years ago and then. Yep. Because because I had talked about it with somebody, but I haven't looked at it recently. So I'll I'll, I'll summarize it. The the yeah. few interesting interesting keys uh, there. So the idea is that we have four general different types of archetype of personality. The idea is not that we're one or the other, but we have all four of them. Only some of them, each of us, have much more than others. So the four of them, the first one. Uh, sometimes called red or dominant or outcome focused. There's people who are tough who are logical, who are competitive. The people are going to be saying, I don't like this. This is bad. I'll just give you the feedback directly because I'm not going to waste time. Let's just do things. Like there's nothing personal. So they can be viewed as being harsh. Of course, the goal is for them to, to help help people make things better. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's constructive, but they don't really understand why people get upset. So that's first type. Second type, big picture thinkers, inspiration driven or yellow. And these are people who like concepts. They like to think. They like to, to to plan things in the big picture. They like uh, they like ideas uh, and like being creative. They like being outgoing. They 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 like to talk to, to groups and enthuse people, mm -hmm. motivate people. And then we have the third uh, type is the people focused, the uh, green or stability, and they have much more empathy. Uh, they're much more understanding. They'll make sure that the group works well. They'll pick up if mm -hmm. anyone is not doing well, they'll go up to them and check everything's okay. They're not that out outgoing and they're willing to make all the compromises to make sure the group is working out. So they're super helpful in any kind of team. And then the last one is the the down to earth, blue, or the, con I think it's conscientious. Uh, and they are the ones who are process driven, who are reliable, who are dependable, who like the details, people who make great lawyers, great accountants. Uh, who, who really go down the detail. So on the one hand, you've got outcome focused, 
driven goals. On the other side, the opposite, we have the people focused, who are willing to compromise. Uh, then you've got the big picture, all the concepts, and then the down to earth, how do we do things? Now, each of these has a particular fear. The fear of the outcome focused is being taken advantage of. It drives them nuts. So if they're afraid of it, they get they're going and they're willing to go for conflict. They're willing to be tough. They don't they, they don't mind that. The inspiration driven, the yellows, uh, big picture thinkers, their fear is rejection. The biggest fear. They identify a lot with the ideas. So if you say, "Hey, let's go to this restaurant," and someone goes, "What that one?" But it's crap. It's ridiculous. Like how, you got such bad taste. They're going to hate that. Mm -hmm. The people focused, their biggest fear is conflict. So anytime there's any threat of conflict, they'll give in because they want to make sure stability is maintained. I mean, that's what the S is for, stability. Mm -hmm. And then the C, uh, the last one's the uh, the down to earth, their fear is making mistakes. So it's interesting with each of those to, to think, uh, to think if you're green, people focused, you're okay being criticized, not a problem. You're okay being told your ideas are crap, provided there's no fighting. So you're willing to be a sort of punching ball. And if you're inspiration driven, then you know you're you're okay with a bit of conflict. Uh, but to be told that your ideas are bad, you know, then it becomes a personal mm -hmm. attack. Oh yeah, so that's the it's the the rejection there. So to be rejected, or to be rejected, or to uh, to have a fight for the people who are uh, green yellow, and I think quite a few people are green yellow tend to be. Mm -hmm. Uh, attracted or tend to attract narcissists. Mm -hmm. um, not only, but there's quite a bit of that. Uh, I think that you know shines a bit of a light on the types of dynamics we can mm -hmm. go. Oh yeah, that's it. We dislike conflict. You know, so if we dislike conflict, all the others have to do is give a constant threat of conflict, and then we give in all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think I think I was a different person. I think I was a different color before I went into that marriage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because. Um, you know, I'm, I'm looking at these and there's, there's a lot that I've, I have processed through because mm -hmm. of, you know, the programming from emotional abuse and the trying to deprogram from emotional yep. abuse and then trying to deal with triggers from emotional abuse. And a lot of it kind of all compiles up. Um, but yeah, my number one client are my healthcare professionals mm -hmm. because they're the service oriented people, which are your green yellows. Absolutely. And you typically are so those are very much people focused. Uh, mm -hmm. The green yellows, uh, very flexible. So between green and yellow, well, it's the model I use is Lumina. Between green and yellow, there's another one which is flexibility, and that's uh, being or oh, inspiration, uh, oh, sorry, flexibility, something like that. So being willing to compromise and be adaptable and adjust to others. And uh, one one of the things I see actually with people is they tend to think we're well, one or the other. But I like the notion of saying. On a scale between zero and ten, how much do you have, or zero to three? So often people think, I'm afraid of being the cold extreme, so I'm going to be completely people focused. And the more I am, the better it is. If I can be ten out of ten of empathy, it's much better because I don't want to be at zero. Whereas we tend to find that if people find a balance, maybe around five, six, seven, mm -hmm. they get better outcomes than if they go for the extreme of ten, where they they end up being a human doormat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And see, like, that was one of the things that I was saying. I was, I wasn't, I wasn't necessarily not like that because I had tendencies, but I was not like that mm -hmm. until I was basically programmed like that, you know, and, and a lot of the times what, what I do, well, actually it's what I do almost all the time. Um, we don't understand ourselves that well because you take the green yellow or you take me and I could look at somebody else and go, how come you're not acting normal? Yeah. Okay. Well, from my point of view, I I'm very emotionally wired. I can only see the world through emotionally wired eyes. So when you see some of these other personalities, like your toxic personality or your controlling personality, you look at them and think, why aren't you acting normal? Mm -hmm. You know, because you only see, you can only see the world, how you see it. And from their point of view and with their personality, they're acting completely normal. Absolutely. But we think if we just sit down and talk to them and tell them what to change and how bad they hurt us, that they're going to wake up and act like us, mm -hmm. you know, and, exactly. and you have to remember, we only think that's normal because that's our personality. And that's, that's one of the things that I, I really teach people. I'm, they have to understand how the, how the toxic, and I use toxic because it's a blanket phrase, obviously, mm -hmm. how the toxic person perceives every situation that they perceive from their eyes. Mm-hmm. 
So it's because as soon as you can understand how the other person in the relationship sees it, you can go, oh, well, that makes more sense. Yes, absolutely. And I think it's very helpful when people understand the different logic. So one thing is to think, I have these personality traits. If I see things from somebody else's point of view, I see things differently. But overall, we're all engaging with the same basic understanding of decency, of uh, respecting each other. But when somebody comes in and hijacks the human traits, hijacks the reciprocity, lies to us, deceives us, you know what, what I notice is a number of people tolerate the toxic people. And they realize it's toxic, but they put up with it. They think, you know, maybe there's a solution. Maybe it's because of something that happened to them. Uh, you know, they often position themselves as being victims that other people have been unfair. There's a lot of this discourse. So maybe there's hope. But as soon as they realize I've actually been screwed over mm -hmm. and they're able to put the words on it, then I think the, the outcome focused side, the red side comes out and goes, someone took advantage of my kindness, mm -hmm. of my generosity, yeah. of my patience, and all of that because of lies. I think that's often one of the triggers of going, you know, wait a minute, I, what, yeah. what the hell is and, going on? And, and, you know, um, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about the beginning stages of the toxic relationship because in the beginning stages, they love everything about you. Mm -hmm. You know, they love your hair. They love your family. They love everything. They love that you're independent. They love, 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 love. And they bring you gifts and, you know, it's perfect. And they met their soulmate and they can't believe they have waited their whole life for you. And you might feel like it's moving fast but you've never had somebody that is so accepting. So maybe you don't know what love is. So you, yeah. you know, you, you kind of step, you step into that. And as soon, as soon as they know that your personality is the one that they need. Okay. Because we step into relationships for certain things like companionship and partnership and intimacy and emotional support. We wouldn't step, we wouldn't even step into a friendship for anything but that. Yeah. And so during this phase, when, when, when they just love us so much, they, they tend to lead us to believe that their goals are the same. So you head down this relationship path thinking, yay, we're going to build this life and we have these same goals. And then their next goal is to get you to invest in the relationship. And that's why these relationships feel like they move fast. They, mm -hmm. they want an investment because the emotionally wired person after there's an investment is going to feel guilty. They're going to feel like they're going back on their word. They feel like they're hurting someone if they've invested and now they want to get out. Do you know so, the, the, so in, go ahead. Okay, go, go, go on, go on. Okay, so let's buy a dog together or let's mm -hmm. move in together or let's get engaged or let's get married right away. Because as soon as they can get us to invest, they, they know it's going to be harder for us to leave. They also want us to believe they're trustworthy. Yep. So during that beginning, you know, they'll, they'll, they want to know what your secrets are and they want to know something nobody else knows. And, and we, we we finally decide to tell them and they come up with something like, oh, I know that same thing happened to me. I know, you know, and they make make something up probably. Yeah. <laughs> but really what they're doing <laughs> exactly. is they're they're packaging it up and they're sticking it in their back pocket. Yes. Because they want to be able to then later pull that out and use it if they need it. And I'm getting to a point here. I, Dr. Heidi is always getting to a point. She just talks and talks and says she's getting to a point. So So once you're invested, almost everybody will say they felt a shift. Everything was good until I got pregnant. Everything was good until we moved in together. And then immediately they feel like the relationship is different. And it's after that initial investment, they can quit pretending their goals. And that's when you might hear a criticism or you might get called a name or they might not come home or, or, or they might be on their phone or something strange. And, and, and really what they're doing is they're moving you into a place that is their main control and power source because you are now emotionally invested, right? So your attention is on them because you live with them, you might work with them, you have kids with them, all of this stuff. So that's a main power control and attention source. So then when they, when they, you know, infidelity, they step out or they have a good group of friends or they do something else, you know, they're getting a lot of attention and admiration from out there. But what you were saying is some people don't stick around. You know, some people might hang out with them for a little while and then be like, oh, well, that guy's not very nice or or she was she says really mean things. And so so you step out of it. Right. Those are the ones who are not yet emotionally invested into the relationship. Yeah. There's, you know? there's a, a term in um, 
behavioral finance for this. You might have heard of the sunk cost fallacy. No. Oh, okay. Sunk cost fallacy. It's beautiful. It's the thing where, let's say, you buy you buy a car, and you start repairing the car, and you invest five thousand dollars repairing the car. You bought the car for, let's say, ten thousand dollars. Then you realize you need to invest another twenty thousand dollars to repair the car, and you think, "Well, I can't stop now because if I stop now, I've lost fifteen thousand dollars. So it's going to cost me twenty thousand dollars to keep going." But I might as well do that because I already, already spent it. Or an- another example, imagine you want to go to the movies and you want to see a introspective Danish psychological movie called Transformers 7, but halfway, you know, after, th- after 15 minutes, you realize it's about robots bashing each other. And you think, well, if I leave now, I've lost the money for the ticket, so I have to sit and watch another two hours of robots bashing each other. When instead you could just go outside and read a book or sit in the sunlight. So the sunk cost fallacy, you've already spent so much you can't walk mm-hmm. away. Or yep. you lend me money and it turns out I'm a con man. But you think, well, I already lent him a thousand, so I might as well lend him another ten thousand because otherwise I've lost the first thousand. The, yeah. These are completely illogical ways of thinking, completely irrational ways of mm-hmm. thinking that seem to make sense, hence the uh, the cognitive biases. Mm-hmm that leads to completely irrational behavior that we do all the time until we become aware of it. The, the, the guy who did that, Daniel Kahneman, won a Nobel Prize for his work on this. Mm. And it's like, like you say, it was interesting because I heard you say this also, you get to a point and there's a shift. And the point usually is the commitment is so high that now I'm going mm. to test it. Because yep. either they, you know, I can always back down if they don't like it, mm-hmm. but if I if I if I'm able to do this test and they don't walk away, it's going to be nearly impossible for them to walk away because of the cognitive dissonance because they yep. stayed. Yep. So it's a it's a buy-in. Yep. Yeah. That yeah. But a, then you spend mm-hmm. then you spend the next you know the next twelve years wondering if you should stay or go. And Absolutely. so you know I, I I do a lot with the explaining emotional abuse. You know we hear it, that's one of those things you hear all the time. You, you know, you hear, oh yeah, because it's all over, just like everything else. And and I know that when I was in my former relationship, there was people that that had told me they thought that was emotionally abusive. Well, first of all, I'm a doctor and I'm educated. So there's no way I'd step into a toxic relationship, right? Um exactly. but I think I think I thought that uh emotional abuse was like verbal. Like, yeah, I had my former husband had a temper and he yelled and he, you know, but I thought that's what it was. And me and my daughters had kind of gotten used to it. So then I, I do the denial thing. Well, well, that's just how he is. And so I thought I had tackled the emotional abuse thing because, you know, if that's that what it is, we'll be fine. But, but I, I do have to do a lot of explaining because emotional abuse is when, you know, they want you dependent on them to tell you how to feel. And, and, you know, they do or say things to get you, you to feel something so that you'll do what they want. And I, I use this example, you know, if, if you get up on a Tuesday morning and you're getting your kids ready for school and you hear your spouse get up and they come down the hall and you hear them talking to the kids and they pet the dog and they come in the kitchen and they, they pick up their coffee and give you a kiss and tell you to have a good day. What kind of day do you have? Yeah. Great day. A good day. The next day, same scenario, morning before school, and you can hear them coming down the hall and they're heavier and there's a... You know, they're hollering at the kid. You hear the dog yelp. They grab their coffee. They slam the door and leave. What kind of day do you have that day? No, terrible day. A terrible, anxious day. So the, you know, the concept, and this is for anybody listening, that the concept of emotional abuse is you're waiting to see what kind of mood they're in and how they're going to treat you and how accepting they are of you that day before you're, before you're okay with knowing how you're supposed to feel. Yep. You know, and, and I, I, I mentioned it earlier. Um, I think the average for leaving a relationship like this is seven times. I I finally left for good on the seventh, but two of the times I left, all he had to say was, I can't believe you're breaking up our family. Mm-hmm. And this is kind of what you're talking about. You, you don't look at the whole picture. I didn't take two seconds to go. This is the most dysfunctional thing that I've ever seen in my life. I just thought, Oh, Oh, he's right. I'm breaking up the family yeah. because he had, he had trained me and guilt was a big thing for me. If he could make me feel guilty, he'd get me to do anything. Well, yeah. my problem was, is I was so dependent on worrying about how he thought I should feel that when he said, 
you're breaking up the family. There was zero logic behind my decision to go back. Uh, apart from apart from the logic was you were feeling terrible with the guilt. The guilt seemed more scary than going back. You knew that you could sort of function if you went back, but the guilt that's something that that, that you know it's something parents do to manipulate children. So it mm -hmm. taps into something very very deep, very profound. We feel unsafe. If we feel guilty, we did something mm -hmm. bad. If other people find out about it, we might be, be quote unquote, expelled from the tribe. Mm -hmm. uh, if we expelled from the tribe, then we're going to die pretty soon. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, if we were cave yeah. people, that would be the, the firing case. squad's going to show up. Yeah. Yeah. Or as cave people, you get kicked out of the cave and then you've got ah. saber toothed tigers and snakes and crocodiles. Yep. So you're dead. So we're yep. hardwired to avoid anything that makes us feel guilty. One of the reasons why, when people use guilt, when adults do it, it's pretty much always manipulation. Yeah. People Always. talk about guilt. And, you know, I see it pretty much all the time now. People using it, oh, you should feel guilty about this, about that. I'm like, that's just manipulation. I don't care what your logic is. Yeah. It is manipulation. As, as soon and as it, they say you should feel. Absolutely. They, yeah. Right. And, you know, we don't like to feel guilty. So these people pick it up very quickly. If I make her feel guilty, she doesn't like that. So mm -hmm. she's going to do whatever she can. Exactly. She, I would rather step back into that awful, terrible environment mm -hmm. so I could get rid of the feeling of guilt. Yeah. than to have the feeling of guilt, even absolutely. though I had absolutely nothing to feel guilty about. Yeah. It's a, a lot of this behavior is very um, unconscious and automatic. I remember mm -hmm. one person, so a short story, I was doing some work in, in Paris and a person had introduced me to her clients. And she said at one point, you know, the way you're working, I could believe that you're trying to steal my clients from me. And of course, I was horrified, completely mortified. I was trying to be super transparent with everything. And I realized afterwards, the only response to that is, well, do you believe it? Because if you do believe it, we need to have a very different conversation. If you're suggesting that I'm the kind of person who tried to steal your clients, we need to have a different conversation about it, or you don't believe it. But to go, I could believe it, it made me feel mm -hmm. terrible for two days. Yes. yes. Like, oh, you know, I knew a bit about the manipulation stuff, but to, to experience that for two days, feeling sick was going, this is weird. This is not normal because I know oh. I've been transparent. Yes. And it makes you question yourself a little bit. Yeah. Because you're like, okay, what did I do to make her think I was going to do that? Because maybe it's, I need yeah. to change my behavior when it could have been nothing. Because I was, I was just going to yeah. say, I've been out of my former relationship for 15 years. Mm -hmm. I've been in another one for 15 years. He actually saved me from that one. And I've been married okay. for 11 years. Yeah. And to this day, if my now husband, who is programmed in my phone as my hot husband, and I would marry him every day of my life, he's the best yeah. thing that ever happened to me. If he comes home from work and he's quiet mm -hmm. because he's very loud and funny and sarcastic. And when he comes home for work, from work quiet, I immediately, regardless of everything and how good our relationship has been, mm -hmm. my first thought is, I wonder if he's mad at me. Because wow. I spent 15 mm -hmm. years in a relationship where it didn't matter what happened, it was my fault. Yeah. And and a few years ago, he finally said, Heidi, if it has something to do with you, I'll tell you. So if mm -hmm. I come home and I'm quiet and I don't tell you, it has nothing to do with you. And I spent almost two years when he would come home, if he was quiet, I would go in the bathroom and I would have to tell myself, he didn't tell me it was about me because I was so programmed to, I must've done something wrong. Now I got to fix it. Now I'm going to be, you know, paying for it for the next, and I would have never thought that this stuff that that I had to adopt for survival mode in my former relationship would still be here. And just this last year, I started having kind of post-traumatic episodes, didn't have them for 12 years. And all of a sudden, here they are. Yeah. And of course, I was mad. I was more mad about that. I was still dealing with it. Mm -hmm. And um of course, as I know, everything happens like it was supposed to. So I had to backtrack and deal with some more stuff. So they were supposed yeah. to happen. Um, but but the I had to do a lot more reading on the long-term effects, right? Because now I have two daughters that are going to be the same. And it has it has definitely made me way more aware of how I operate in this world today. Because a lot of it is just like that immediate response of, Yep. If if I would, um, along the lines of, of you stealing someone else's clients, when I started this job, I knew there was a chance I would have some haters because mm -hmm. if someone finds out I'm working with their spouse and their spouse leaves or whatever, <laughs> and I would get hate emails 
And I remember there was a couple of times I thought maybe I shouldn't be doing this because I'm making these people mad. Mm. And then I thought, okay, you're, you're worrying about making the people mad that are abusing your clients. Yep. You know, so the next hate email that came in, it, it had not a nice subject line, like a mm-hmm. very, very bad one. And I cut it out and I pasted the subject line on my computer to remind myself that, that my mission wasn't to keep everybody happy. My p- mission was to keep my clients safe and get them in a safe environment. But yep. there were several times that I felt like I was offending people. Um, some of my friends and some of my family did not like the fact that I wanted to do this and be out there telling my story. Mm-hmm. And I had to really... I really had to really overcome that because I, I could have not pursued this because of what other people thought, yeah. you know, that that reminds me of, um, as a American philosopher, Peter Bogosian, who's asked, so he does something called street epistemology, where he tries to understand how people change opinions, mm-hmm. like based on which facts and how do you, how do you make somebody change their mind or just move a little bit? And he keeps getting these mentally unhinged people who come and insult him. And he, he gets asked, like, how do you deal with that? He goes, well, listen, if you're in a bar with some friends and somebody runs in and walks, you know, runs into the men's restroom, starts chewing a, a urinal tablet, comes out and accuses you of stealing the cockroach collection, do you worry about what they think? Exactly. Goes, no, the person's <laughs> mentally ill. Exactly. I know, you know, but I'll tell you, I was, I was embarrassingly so programmed. I was... Like, well, you, you had used the word doormat. I try not to use that word very often, but um, <laughs> it was literally, okay, yeah. What do you want me to do next? Do you need me to do anything? Do you need me to get anything? Oh, you mm-hmm. want me to fix that? Okay. You sit down like, and, and when I first stepped into this relationship, yep. I was a hundred miles an hour. I can get more stuff done in a day. And finally my husband is like, oh my gosh, I can get my own dinner. I like literally can make the bed like. And, and he, he couldn't believe the stuff that I just automatically did because I was so programmed to do it. He's like, changing the oil in the car isn't even your job. Why are you doing that? Mm, Well, because I knew how, and because I used to have to do it. Now I'm spoiled rotten. I hardly have to, I hardly have to do anything. Um, But it is, it is uh, very, very eye opening to see even, even this long after I've been in it, how much of my nervous system still plays off of that environment. To to what extent do you think it started there or it was before? I asked the question because I know a few people who whose whose approach to conflict is to think it must be something I did. So mm-hmm. if someone's in a bad mood, it must be me, be it my partner, be it a parent, be it a stranger in the street. If someone is unpleasant to me, it must be something I did because if it is, it means it's under my control. If it isn't, then the world's a scary place. So logically, it must be me. So what was the question? How did that start? Yeah. Is it, is it something that you can relate to uh, that you oh. were having before, or did it start oh. with a relationship? Um, well, that's funny that you ask that, because I always thought I had this perfect little life, and then all of a sudden, this guy came out of nowhere and just steamrolled it, right? So logic would tell me that I would get out of that relationship, and things would go back to the same. Mm -hmm. Well, they didn't. And I had a lot of struggles and I had a lot of emotional stuff I couldn't deal with. And, and a couple of years ago, when those episodes started, I started digging around. Okay. Okay. I grew up in a little, a little Christian community on a, in a dairy farming community um, in Montana. I don't know Mm -hmm. if you're familiar with the series Yellowstone. Uh, Everybody knows it now. I grew up in that town that that series was filmed in. And it was very, it was a very isolated community. You know, everybody knew everybody. We all went to the same church. We all went to the same school. And, and I think, I think I thought that everybody was like that. And I was the only extrovert in my family. My Mm -hmm. mom to this day doesn't really hug. She never really told us she loved us. She's just not emotional. My sisters are quiet. Mm-hmm. I was the loudest thing that had hit Montana ever. And yeah, if I had a dollar, now I didn't think about this until just a couple of years ago. If I had a dollar for every time I heard, Heidi, sit down. Heidi, be quiet. Heidi, you've got too much energy. Heidi, you need to go outside. I started adapting very, I learned very quickly that people didn't like Heidi when she was loud. People didn't like Heidi when she was active. People didn't like Heidi when she was, you know, walking on her hands across the kitchen floor. 
And so then I kind of went, okay, let's, let me look at my grade school years. Okay. Those were pretty rough. My junior high years, I was the one that was changing to try and fit into one of the girls groups. Right. And by the time high school came, I had shitty boyfriends. I just swore on your podcast. That's right. <laughs> Don't let my dad listen. <laughs> But, but I did, I thought they were, I thought they were good as first boyfriends, but they'd break up with me to go out with somebody else. And then guess who'd be standing there for them to come back, mm -hmm. you know? And so I used to blame a lot on my former, but I started adapting very, very early. And I'll never forget. He asked me out and I did not want to go on a first date. You, I had that gut feeling. Yep. Something didn't feel right. But by the 14th time he asked me out, my personality started feeling guilty and I started feeling like the bad person. And I started feeling mm -hmm. off. So I went out with him yep. and I didn't want to go on the second date. And it was the same thing. Well, then I was pregnant and then I was married and then I was pregnant again. Then we had a business together and it just, and 14 years later, you know, yep. um, they, there's two interesting things about my, my story that not that I, I don't really want to tell my story, but one of the things that is so embarrassing for me, but it's so important for people to hear is I ended up having to run away. But when I ran away, I had already been divorced for two years. Mm -hmm. um, I divorced him over girlfriend number 15, at least. Now we were talking about, we keep looking for one more thing. I would always say, okay, if he has another girlfriend, I'm leaving. Well, it would come to the point where he'd have another girlfriend and I was scared of him. And I would, you know, he would threaten me. I wouldn't have any money. Blah, 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 blah. So then it would be okay on the next one. So, so if, if you think you need a reason pull up the rug because there was 14 girlfriends under my rug that I could have left over. But what happened was I filed for divorce and I was so excited and nothing changed for two years. He basically kept it. So all the money went through the business. So I, I it wasn't that I didn't have money, but I didn't have access to it. Yep. Um, and it kept getting worse and worse because I started standing up for myself. And when I started standing up for myself, it started getting, it started getting physical. It was pushing and shoving. Um, he broke into my house one time and destroyed everything in my house. Okay. Um, these were just, he felt me slipping out from underneath his control. So he had to get bigger. It, it just started escalating. And so I just had the accountant meet me one day and I signed my practice over to him and I gave him my patients and I gave him the property. And initially I had to leave my kids. I had two daughters. Yes. Yeah, I, I still have two daughters. Ask about, I want to talk about that because that is um, not, I've got obviously not easy. So how did you, oh, how do you make that decision? Um, so there, there's what, there's one dynamic that was going on. Um, and it, and it all falls, it all falls and fits into this emotional abuse story so well, but my daughter started rodeoing very young. Do you know what rodeo is? Yes. Okay. They were barrel racing. It's the three barrels. Okay. My oldest started winning a lot of stuff. She was winning the adult stuff at nine and 10 years old. Um, and that got him a lot of recognition. Because at nine and 10, she's going in there and she's winning trucks and she's winning horse trailers. And so he always got to do the interview and he always got attention. And, you know, and it it got to where if she didn't win first, then she was in trouble. And so it, it got it went from something very good to something icky. But Mesa was at the top of the game when I had to leave and he was not going to let her take her horses if she moved with me. Wow. OK. Well, yeah, so I was the blackmail. Oh, it's. It's, it was ridiculous, but I had already signed over my half of the practice and basically gave him 12 years worth of my work. And so I wouldn't have ever been able to support that financially anyway, but our divorce decree said 50, 50. Now I moved okay. four hours South because, because I had left him six times and I, I knew I could not be in the same vicinity because things had escalated. Um, he refused to sign a parenting plan and he kept them for five years from me. Um, I could have taken him back, but my driving force was my girls did not have the mother they needed. I couldn't stand up to him for them. They saw an example of somebody who couldn't protect them. And so I made the decision for two reasons, to get myself healthy and to make them a place that, that if we could get them out of there, they'd have a safe, peaceful place where they were loved unconditionally. That was my goal. And the other thing, my girls were smart. They had been in it as long as I had but I had been trying to cover up his behavior. You know, oh, dad just had a bad day. Don't make dad mad tonight. Just, you know, cause he's gonna yell. 
And I decided they have to see his true colors because I can't protect him. I can't protect them even if I'm there. So, so they at some point have to see who he really is so that when they're 18, they get to make the decision on the relationship they want with him. So when, when you say protect, I hear protect them from the truth. No, no, just um, like his punishments were pretty harsh. Um, he would, okay. he would, they were building barns with a tool belt when they were four and five. Okay. He took them out of school to homeschool because he didn't want us socially interacting with anyone else because he had complete control over the three of us. Okay. So if he would be like to protect him, if he would be angry with one of them, there was no way I could step in and intervene as the other parent okay. because it would get, it would just make everything more volatile. Understood. Yeah. Okay. So protect so, physically as well. Yeah. So okay. all three of, yeah. all three of us knew we, we knew exactly how to respond to his moods. We knew exactly what to do. We knew to keep ourselves safe. Everybody would do their part until he calmed down. Wow. Okay. But I knew, I knew that if, if, if they didn't, see what it really was without me there, yep. they would be 40 years old and he would still be controlling them. I left them when they were 11 and 13 and they also ran away at 17 and 19. Wow. Okay. And came back and now they're 28 and 26 and I have fantastic relationships with both of them and neither of them have talked to their dad in a few years. Wow. Because it is not that they don't want to, but anytime they step in, his goal is to control. So he, he manipulates them. I'll give you some land. I'll buy you a horse. I'll, well, they, it's always, it's always just blackmail because it always ends up exactly the same. So, yeah. um, uh, that was, that was the hardest thing I've ever gone through was I moved. So I was a doctor with no patients. I didn't have a business. I had no friends here. I had no money and I didn't have my kids. Mm. When, I don't even know. I don't even know how I made it from one day to the next sometimes, Yeah. but it's made me really good at my job. And even though I know I didn't deserve it, I am thankful that that I was the one that was chosen to go through it because I I really am passionate about the work that I do and that's exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah. I think with the with the children, I had, I had a client recently who was having a very tough time with his two boys. The mother was turning the boys against him. And it's really tough to do on the moment, but it's thinking, you know. If you imagine the film of your life and you know it's going to end okay, and you know that in five or 10 years, you're going to be able to click and connect, would it be all right? And he said, you know, of course it would, but I don't know if it will be. Mm -hmm. Sometimes just about saying, you know, you've got to trust the process. You don't have that much, mm -hmm. many options. Yeah. You know, People told me all the way through, your girls will be back. And I'm like, by four, by four and a half years, that's when I started this business because I knew I had to redirect. I had to redirect. Yeah. Um, I was literally in my chiropractic office going, yeah, yeah, whatever, get on the table. Like I was burned out with that. I was mm. burned out because I didn't have my kids. So when about four and a half years, I, I decided I was going to start this business. And, um, and within six months, uh, yeah, they were here for, for the people that are having trouble with their kids. I just put a post in my support group last night. You have to remember that when you were there, you tried to keep the peace. You always had to take their side. Um, you know, you did everything they said because you didn't want conflict. And now you are removed. But when the kids have to go there, they are still in it. So they're trying to keep the peace with the toxic parent. They're trying to do what they say. They're and they would rather have you mad at them than the toxic parent mad at them because they know you love them un unconditionally and the toxic parent will give and take his love away. So that was the thing that kept me going was I have to establish a safe, peaceful place yep. for them. And I know, I know why they're mad. I mean, he made up a letter like, and told them I didn't want him anymore. And, and honestly, I don't, I don't believe, I mean, I, I was beside myself when I heard that. I don't believe my girls believed it for one second. He blocked me on their phones and told them I blocked him. Well, are you kidding me? They're teenagers. I think they can figure that out on a phone. Um, but, but they knew that they wanted to still ride. They knew mom would be okay. And they felt a little bit bad because dad was by himself because he played that card a lot. Yeah, of course. But he literally took them and put them right in the control power place that I had left. And, it, and they were, they were scared of him too. When I say scared, it's not always scared for your physical safety. Now towards the end for me, I was running for my life. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't have, he wouldn't have purposely killed me. It would have been some accident in a fit of rage or something. Mm -hmm. And I thought if I stay here any longer, 
something really bad is going to happen. But what I was more afraid of was fear of upsetting him, fear of making him mad, you know, fear of having conflict, fear of being punished. And so they, they keep, they keep you in fear. And if you're in fear of somebody, your attention is always on them. Right. I mean, have you ever seen, have you ever seen Jaws? Yes. Yeah. The fish doesn't have to be in the picture, but our head, the whole movie goes, where's the freaking fish? It's And so, so we all operated with our attention on him and then trying to live our life over here while we kept our attention on him to keep everything safe. It's thing though with with fear, fear is about the uncertainty. There's a danger Mm -hmm. and we don't know what it is, or we don't know if we can cope, or we don't know when it's coming, or we don't know what we did. If we knew exactly what would happen, we could prepare for it, but it's the uncertainty. So once we realize that, uh, it's much easier just to think, okay, I understand what I'm, I'm scared of the fact that I don't know what's going to happen or if I can cope with it, but then we can start breaking it down. Uh, and then of course, well, breathing a bit, but also whenever there's danger, you know, the fact that we do this, we open the eyes. So we focus on where's the information coming from, which means we're not, first of all, we're not breathing. So we're not living. Yep. You know, the diaphragm gets blocked the, the, like that. So first thing I, think I spent do, the last three years of that relationship, not breathing. Yeah. Not surprised. Not surprised. Yeah. And so the, the the diaphragm gets trapped. And also one of the things is, uh, it's always interesting for people to know this, when we don't breathe, sadness gets trapped in the diaphragm. So the sadness doesn't come out. And until it comes out, until it, uh, until it comes out, we're keeping all of this inside. So we're much more emotionally blocked. And it's not easy to let go of that. We have to let go of the sadness, so cry a lot, and also let go of the anger and the rage that we have against the other person but also often against ourselves because unconsciously we let it happen to us mm-hmm. and we have to go through the process of forgiving ourselves for, you know, being duped. I mean, we were duped, so it happens, but we have um, to go through the process. Yeah. It's funny. I have never, ever said this on a podcast before, but since you were talking about the diaphragm and how things get trapped. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I had, I have done acupuncture before I am no longer practicing as a chiropractor. I do this full time now, but, Mm -hmm. um, in acupuncture, you know, the lines here that nobody likes. Yeah. Okay. Those are, those are caused the liver is the organ that, that any acupuncture or gurus out there, don't quote me on any of this that holds the emotion. And those lines are from emotional grief or emotional pain. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, you can see some on, on here. But when I, when I left, they were huge. I had great, big, huge lines in my forehead and I got my acupuncture certification after I moved. So I was like, Oh my goodness. Well, and now I'm getting old enough that I'll probably just Botox. (laughs) But but there's, there's a lot of stuff like that. And, you know, I ended up, you know, being in as six, about six weeks after I, I got out of that, I started getting sick. I started getting kidney infections and bladder infections and sinus infections. And I spent 15 years, never sick. I never had to eat. I never had to sleep. I was a hundred miles an hour because my adrenal, which is your stress response system was running. And when I finally got out six weeks later, my body basically said, we're not doing this. And it took, it took almost seven years for me to get a negative adrenal test. Wow. Well, basically, once we're out, the body goes, I'm safe. Now I can relax. Mm-hmm. Now I can deal with all the problems I've been bottling up. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the the kidney, that's the organ where we store a lot of anger. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the th- tricks people can do is to film themselves in slow motion, talking about how they're feeling. And then we'll see micro expressions that appear, which often are macro expressions. And mm-hmm. the face tells us exactly what we're feeling. So uh, I remember one person when I was going, uh, having a tough time in an unhealthy relationship asked me, you know, so how are you doing? And I basically replied something like, oh, I'm really happy with a very, like, I could feel my faith. Yeah. Just being incredibly sad. I didn't understand what was going on, but then I already done this, this uh, lie detection course. And it's basically was telling me, okay, your face says that. So you're miserable, but yeah. in my mind, it you doesn't make any sense. We're bringing up such, we're bringing up such fun things that I never talk about. So I, I went through the facial diagnosis courses. Seriously. Excellent. Yes. But we don't tell anybody because I don't want anybody to know I'm looking at their face. Um, (laughs) Yeah. So I don't, but that, that was, and then I did, you know, anti-aging acupuncture facials, but that what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm very fascinated by that. I don't miss healthcare, but I miss, I miss some of that stuff. Yeah. But facial diagnosing is is scary too, because, you know, one of your kids comes home with 
a boyfriend they want you to meet and you take one look at their face and you're like, oh, great. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's that's likely to be the case. Especially like right for the first six months after I went through the courses, I was doing that. And finally, I'm like, you've got to stop, stop doing that. But but that was very interesting. Oh, it's it's fascinating to do. And I, I wonder what is one what is one common mistake you see people making when they're going through all of this, and how could they avoid it? A uh, common mistake. Yeah. Well, I actually like somebody who's in a relationship like this. Yeah, for example. I think I have probably a lot of them, but the one that's sticking out to me right now is we continually think that if we take the high road, we're going to get what we want, and so we keep giving and we keep compromising and we keep accommodating. And I see a lot of people do that going through a divorce process. And I have to remind them, did it help you at all when you were in the marriage to take the high road and get what you wanted? Then why are you thinking for some reason that you're going to get what you want in this and that that they're going to be a good Mm co-parent? There's there's a mistake or there's a a misconception that when we file for divorce, all of a sudden we're going to be great parents. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, um, and people get very disappointed in the fact that there's times they they can't communicate with the other parent because they still want to control them, which is why my life didn't change for two years. Yep. You know, he didn't care if we were married or not, as long as he was still getting what he needed. And I think, you know, my dad told me the quote that has been the most impactful quote of my entire life. He said, you're never going to have inner peace until you accept people for who they are, not who you want them to be. No, that's a good one. Very good. And and because I kind of wanted revenge, not to hurt him, but I wanted him exposed when I first left. Mm-hmm. And when and I talked to my dad about that. And and it was so reassuring because basically what my decision was is I'm gonna accept him for who he is, but he has to go be that not in my life. Yeah. And and he's actually been married two or three times, and the cycle is exactly the same. Somebody mm-hmm. I, I picture the 50s operator. Somebody unplugs him from his life and he just picks somebody else and plugs him in and the whole thing starts completely over. Yeah. But that accepting and knowing he didn't ask to have that personality. He had a horrible upbringing, which kept me feeling sorry for him for a really long time. And accepting the fact that he didn't ask to be like that, but he just can't be in my life. Yeah, I think I think that's key. It's uh, I remember talking with my so I, did, I did some training in Kazakhstan and they were talking about toxic people saying they've got every right to do that. They've got every right to be unreasonable, to make all these requests. And you've got every right to say no. Mm-hmm. And they've got every right to be angry that you say no. They've got every right to do that. And you've mm-hmm. got every right to shrug it off and not care. It's fine. Mm-hmm. Is You have the freedom and they've got the freedom. Yes. Um, and, you know, we all have toxic traits. We can all criticize. We can all manipulate. Well, I probably couldn't. If I told you to go out and manipulate three people tomorrow, could you do it? Probably I, not. I could. I wouldn't want to. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't. I'd be like, I wouldn't even know how to do that. I'd be like waving this hand and hitting him with that hand. That would be the only thing I would know how to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. But no, I, um, I, I'd know how to do it. I wouldn't want to do it. It's uh, no, it's, because it's just not 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 the, yeah. not the way I want um, to live. But, yeah. uh, what, what you were just talking about. I am now finally settled with this conversation. Okay. But, but the man that I married to now, he knew what he was getting into. He, he knew he had no idea it was going to be as extreme as it was when it first started. But Mm -hmm. we had discussions going through. And as I, as I healed, I got better at accepting this discussion, but, and a lot of other people have asked me this too. You know, I know you felt like you couldn't leave, but you know, you had the free will to leave, right? And I would go, no, I didn't. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. Because, and I'd list 29 things why I couldn't. And he'd go, Heidi, you had the free will to leave. No, no, no. And then he'd wait a couple of years and he'd try the discussion again, Mm -hmm. you know? And I think probably, probably four or five years ago, probably because I started doing this, I finally was like, yeah, I, I absolutely, absolutely had the free will to leave. Yeah. That's, that's a good point. we, we can feel like we don't, the option isn't there. And I think it's important to recognize it felt like the option wasn't there and just go, why? Why is it that sometimes we feel uncomfortable mm-hmm. saying things or doing things? Why is it that we don't sometimes stand up for ourselves? And then just to observe that, it's auto- automatic responses. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then it's also wrapping our head around the fact that probably we never were taught 
to act a certain way. You, before you were talking about your your upbringing and saying you you adapted a lot in transactional analysis, there literally is one of the the archetypes is the adapted child, the child who is told you're not good the way you are. You have to change, or else you won't feel safe and you won't be loved. Mm -hmm. So you have to do whatever a figure of authority, a parent figure, tells you to do. Mm -hmm. So it's not your choice. It's not your responsibility. It's not you, it's not up to you to choose the consequences. You will do what we say or else. And as long mm -hmm. as we're trapped in that, we go looking for authority figures who will tell us what to do. Because as long as someone is telling us what to do, we feel safe. And that's what we really want, basically, as children, is yep. to be safe. Okay. You know what? I have to stop you because what, what you just said, this just hit me like a freight train. You were just talking about the... Uh, you're going to have to tell me what it was. The adaptive... Adaptive child. Okay. See, if you would have said that to me two years ago, it would have flown right over my head because... And if you would have said, you know, a parent is telling them that you're not good the way you are, that would have flown right over my head because mm -hmm. it it wasn't like that. It was, Heidi, just be quiet. Like, Heidi, you know, so it wasn't aggressive and it wasn't so the therapy term and, and telling me what to do, I would have been like, oh, that's not me. Mm -hmm. But then... It was, it was just, and so that's, that's basically what, you know, what I do, but that, that, see, that's exactly what I was talking about. So I'm glad you said that. Yeah, um, exactly. That's the, you know, with adaptive child, it, you know, simple as, you know, stop asking so many questions, go and clean your room, you know, make mm -hmm. less noise, be quiet. And again, it can be said very lovingly, oh, please be quiet for a bit. I, oh, you know, I'm tired, just not now, mm -hmm. you know, so it can be very gentle versus very aggressive. And still the message is change something. You're, you're not enough. You're not mm -hmm. okay. Uh, yeah. And then um, I was blessed with a sister that was skinny and had straight A's and liked the good boys and, you know, was valedictorian. Yeah. And so it was always, well, Jill got $25 from her report card. Ooh, you know, geez. look, at, yeah. but yeah. I didn't think of it like that then. No, of course not. Because at, at that age, we think, well, obviously it must be me the problem. Yes. Obviously. And, and, Yes. And that's why still to this day, when my husband comes home and he's quiet, guess who's the problem, you know? And so I have, I've had to, I've had to do so much, um, emo, you know, emotional work because mm -hmm. my emotions literally think the way I was supposed to think in that mm -hmm. and fix it, you know? Yeah. That, that's the case. And until so we can deal with the emotions, the emotional, the emotions guide us. Mm -hmm. And, uh, the, the, I like to use the image of the rider sitting on an elephant, the rider's the rational mind, the elephant is the unconscious mind. So the elephant does whatever it wants to do in order to feel safe. So if it's full of emotions, it's full of emotions. If it feels threatened or insecure, it will do whatever it takes. If it has to adapt, it will adapt. We can rationalize as much as we like, but you know, it's a cute elephant that just needs a bit of love and a bit of acceptance. Mm -hmm. And you know, to feel that we're on the elephant side. Uh, and the the more we can let the elephant just release the emotions, it needs to cry. Let it cry. If it's angry, okay, it's angry. You know. We can then strategize, we can rationalize and strategize, but let's note the emotion, figure mm -hmm. out what we can do to make things better and then make things better. And then, then things work out. Yeah. And I think that was a struggle to be for me too. So, so I start this very early on with my clients. I spent my entire life with three emotions. I was happy if the people around me were happy. Mm -hmm. I was sad if the people around me were sad or somebody told me to be sad and I was mad, but you couldn't show you were mad. So you had to go be mad somewhere else. So nobody knew you were mad. Wow. Okay. Yeah. You know, and, and then the, my former marriage emotions were very invalidated. Well, okay. you're supposed to communicate in a marriage. Okay. Well, I feel like this. Well, why do you feel like that? Well, you shouldn't feel like that. <laughs> well, how can you feel like that? Okay. So then, you, so oh, then you're like, Oh, now, yep. now I have to explain. And so, so you just, you'll get the feedback from them. So the next time that happens, you're just going to feel like they think you should feel because it's, it's easier than trying to explain how you feel and them going, well, you shouldn't feel like that. Yeah, exactly. That's um, the, my favorite. My my least favorite one is when somebody goes, it, it, let's just say, you know, you really hurt my feelings. Oh, well, that wasn't my intention. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, good. If it wasn't your intention, then yeah. I guess. Yeah. Thank goodness for that. If it was your intention, <laughs> we wouldn't be having this conversation, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, funny. And that's so, th so I know that that through that and through, I mean, you know, through my former, um, I, I have had to really learn to not look at how other people think I should feel. And I have gone through a lot of stuff where I check my emotions five or six times a day for a while. And they're completely different from morning till night. There's like 8,000 emotions and I was operating on three and one I couldn't show, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely.
No, now I'm that. starting to love them. I, the, way, the way I view them is like a dashboard. So each of them has an information and I either pick up on the information or I try to ignore it. But if we want to ignore the emotions, we ignore all of them. So we can block them. So mm -hmm. we can block anger, sadness, and fear, but then we also block joy. And mm -hmm. a joyless life is not very much fun. So I, Oh boy, I'll tell you when I left, I didn't have any. Because, mm -hmm. you know, anything that I accomplished would bring me attention. So so we weren't allowed to celebrate that. Mm -hmm. And and then, so I would minimize everything. So I I minimized the good things that should have been celebrated and I made them little and I, I minimized the mean things and the horrible behaviors and made them little. So, so I, I didn't ever feel anything. You could have, you could have steamrolled over top of me and I wouldn't have noticed. In fact, um, I keep pointing here, like my husband's behind me. He's not, he's hunting. I don't know why I'm pointing over there. Um, he, for, for years had, had said that, I don't know what happened to you. You were like, you were like, so, um, I could say anything to you when I first met you and you're so sensitive now. Well, that's because when you first met me, I mean, I had, I had zero emotion because I didn't dare be happy because it didn't last too long. And I definitely couldn't be sad because then I was accused of, you know, needing mental help or whatever. And, and I had to laugh at him that day. I said, Oh, that's because I've developed feelings finally. Yes. But yeah. he just, he knew he met me when I was just hard as a rock yeah. and, and so he, so now he's like, oh, so in 12 years now I have to watch what I say, but, <laughs> um, he's, he's gone through a lot. He's got gone through a lot with me. In fact, this year, after being married for 11 years, he was on the podcast with me finally and talked about Ooh, what amazing. it was like to have to date me and, and accept the girls, you know, yeah. stabbing me in the back. And it was, it was, it was a fun experience to have him on there. Ah, uh, fascinating. And by the way, uh, just before we wrap up, where can people find you? Um, you can go to my website, which is coaching with Dr. Heidi. And I use coaching with Dr. Heidi because some people have to find me in secret. So it doesn't advertise, but it's coaching mm -hmm. with Dr. Heidi. Oh, uh, my podcast is it's not normal. It's toxic. Mm -hmm. And, um, I have a support group on Facebook and then I also have a community. Awesome. And I always take private clients, but coaching with Dr. Heidi, will get you to wherever you need. That is fantastic. Thank you. I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you for having me. It was fun. Pleasure. Very much so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. So we'll be in touch. And everyone, uh, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for listening. And I uh, wish you all the best. And do check out uh, Heidi's website and podcast. Bye.